Uh, well, hello and welcome uh, to the 2020 ICMJ Careers Week. Uh, my name is Rosie O'Reilly um, and my role in ICMJ is the Careers Expo Coordinator and today I'll be chairing our session. So before we jump into the careers panel session, I just thought it'd be nice to give a bit of an overview about who ICMJ is and what it is that our mission is. Uh, so the Australian Intercollegiate Me Charging Association or ICMJ is a not-for-profit association. Um, we're in our 31st year of existence um, and we've built up a strong relationship with the red meat industry. Now, our mission is to inspire and develop young professionals into the global red meat industry. So annually, um, we aspire to achieve this by hosting two tertiary programs, uh, one in Rockhampton and one in um, Wagga in southern New South Wales. Unfortunately, due to the global pandemic that we're all um, having challenges with, um, these face-to-face -face programs have been cancelled for 2020. However, with adversity does come opportunity um, and we've jumped on board with a number of digital platforms to ensure that we can still fulfil our mission um, to graduates that are looking for career pathways into the red meat industry. So to help achieve um, our mission, this year we've decided um, to host a careers week. Um, so for the next three days, we've got events happening. So starting today, um, we've got our careers panel session. Now we've got leaders from beef, lamb and the pork sectors. So we've got producers, processors and um, personnel from the R&D organisations. Now, the idea behind today is to really discuss the pathways in which the panellists have been through um, to just get a bit of an idea on how they've um, progressed through the industry to where they are today. And then also what employers are looking for in graduates. Um, these guys are all employed in the industry and they're employing people. So what do they look for when they're employing graduates? Uh, so panellists will be given a brief opportunity just to uh, enlighten you of their pathway and then the floor will become open for all the students. Now, as Amy mentioned, um, we'll be using the chat function. Um, so on the right hand side of your screen, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat function and uh, we'll endeavour to get those answered for you. Now, tomorrow at 12 p.m. we've got a professional development workshop. We've got two guest speakers. Um, the first one is Nigel Crawley from Rimfire Resources and he'll be um, doing a workshop about how to prepare yourself for your first job interview and tips, tips to get ready for employment. Um, the second workshop will be with uh, Ian Mill, Chief Executive of Beef Australia, and he'll be looking at um, doing a session on how to utilise your networks. So the idea behind these sessions is to really get you prepared to meet prospective employers. And then Friday is our um, showcase event. Um, 2020 has certainly thrown some challenges at us, but we've been able to ensure we can still provide a careers expo. Um, and this year we're really excited to be able to provide you um, with 34 companies coming to the careers expo. Um, this just really highlights the value in which companies see of ICMJ graduates. So it really highlights the demand for those students that have gone through the ICMJ program. Now, if you are a student and you haven't registered on the Careers Fair app plus, um, plus app, can you please do so um, as soon as possible? Um, spots are filling quite quickly and we would hate for you to miss out on meeting your potential employees. Um, it really is um, a place where you could meet uh, the people you'll be working for tomorrow. Personally, I competed in the program back in 2012 and it's through this program that I've never had to formally apply for a role. It's through those networks that I developed in the program um, that I've been able to find full-time employment. So I really could not um, recommend the program high enough for you. Lastly, we've, we've just got a, um, a poll which we'd like you to complete. Um, Amy's gonna chuck that up on the screen, but basically it's, it's where you're at um, and we'd just like to be able to, to see that. Um, so with that said, we might jump into the careers panel session. So we've got four speakers. Um, we've got Margot Andre, uh, CEO of Australian Pork Limited. We've got Molly Greentree, who's working for Tees in, she's currently in the graduate program. We've got Tom Bull, General Manager of Lampo. And then we've got Troy Setter, CEO of CPC. Margot, I might just throw it over to you first. Um, if you could give us a bit of a background of who you are and, and your pathway through the industry. 
Easy done. And thanks, Rosie. Um, so good morning, everyone. And um, thanks for taking time out to listen to all of us today. Um, we hope you get some tips and tools from us. And a um, special shout out to the ICMJ team. Well, the work they do is phenomenal. And um, it's great to see this continue, even though we are facing a pandemic. So, um, so a quick 60 second overview of me. Um, country girls through and through from Burke in New South Wales and um, early childhood in Warren. Um, so a real ingrained passion for rural and regional Australia and the people who live there in the communities. I think without those wonderful communities um, being sustained, life will be a little bit worse off. So um, I um, originally um, left school very early, um, probably around just the uh, beginning of year 11, because um, I wasn't quite the fit at school. So I went off and um, no surprise to anyone who knows me, um, worked in retail and sold shoes. So not your usual um, introduction to a career in agriculture, but um, when I was about 20, I had an opportunity to relocate to Canberra and um, just took a job at the University of New South Wales. And to give you a bit of insight into who I am, I couldn't even type, but I just said yes. So I um, learned to take a job as a, an office manager at that time. So, but what I actually found was I had um, a really strong work ethic and when opportunities came my way, I said yes. So I actually went back and did HSC when I was 22 and then started studying um, slightly later in life. So, um, but I was really lucky in the opportunities and work ethic led me to some great opportunities. And I ended up with CSIRO, working with them in the climate adaptation area. So I spent 10 wonderful years working um, running uh, portfolios that initially started around one to two million dollars and we grew them to 20, 30 million dollars worth of research that impacts climate. So um, absolute passion for what we can do to protect our planet moving forward. Um, then a few years ago I had an opportunity to um, step into the beef industry. So um, two months into a job I found myself the acting CEO of Cattle Council of Australia and um, found that whilst I had always been critical of myself for not being specific in a, an industry. Um, the passion for agriculture actually led me to be a strong generalist and I found I had a knack for being a CEO, whether it was finance, um, strategy, people, and fundamental to all of that is um, producers across the beef industry, um, just trying to make sure they knew we had their back when we were advocating for those key issues that were facing the beef industry. Um, and then about 12 months ago, I had an opportunity to step in to run the Australian Pork Limited. So for those who don't know, we're a $5.3 billion industry. We have about 36,000 employees across the country. Um, everything in the supply chain, we're a very vertically integrated supply chain. So a lot of our theories do flow right through to the end user. Um, we have about 10% of our market is exported. So we're actually an Australian focused industry. Um, which is nice. We do a lot of work around the country of origin, Australian labelling. So we fully believe in Australia, Australian industries and supporting and feeding Australians here. So um, we have a research and development to marketing and a policy component. So we're one industry body that supports all of those areas across the pork industry. So while Rosie talks about red meat, we're reclaiming the pink meat. And in our marketing campaigns, a lot of you might have seen where um, we're the cheeky industry. So, you know, getting some pork on your fork and um, fancy a quickie and things like that. So you can have some fun and actually teach people that protein's a really valuable part of their diet um, and a nutritious part. We're on the edge of being a really exciting industry too. We're now venturing in an strategic plan into pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals, so collagen, um, heparin, things like that for um, medications. So, um, a pig is not a pig anymore. Um, yes, it's great to enjoy it, um, but there's a lot of opportunities for us in diverse markets around our product. Um, and for those on the call, when you buy your ham and bacon, 80% of it's imported. So make sure you look for the Australian made country of origin, the little bar chart down the bottom. So, um, so that's me in a nutshell. My best advice to you all is um, when you get an opportunity, say yes. Um, it's it's easy to not back yourself. It's easy to not um, to talk yourself out of opportunities, but at minimum say maybe, because at least then people will know to come to you with those opportunities. Um, a couple of good things though, um, as an employer, I do check social media profiles. I do note email addresses. So 
sexy chick at or a hot bloke at, you know, they're not always the good ones to have. So, um, and the other best advice I can get is that um, I, I employ graduates here quite regularly and a lot of it is on who they are. So it's not just your degree, it's, it's how you come across. Um, it's got to be a balance of kindness, um, work ethic, and what you know. So um, always treat people when you meet them as they could be your next employer because they might be. Um, so that would be, I hope that's a bit over my 60 seconds, Rosie, but um, that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Now, very diverse career, that's for sure, and some awesome advice there um, to finish with. We might just jump over to Troy. Um, Troy, CEO of CPC, um, if you could give us a bit of an insight into who you are. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rosie. Um, I uh, currently work at uh, at CPC Consolidated Pastoral Company, and uh, we're private equity owned. So I am out of out of the UK. So we sit in a, a global blind pool fund um, with wind farms and, and renewable energy, McDonald's stores, um, retail, hotels, all sorts of things. And so I. I said, you know, the CPC business today is uh, is about 200 people in Australia, 200 team members in Australia, about 600 in Indonesia. Um, but our business does form, you know, sits in a private equity vehicle. So I've spent a lot of time on, uh, you know, uh, with hedge fund managers and investors and, and shareholders, as well as station managers on the ground and then you know, butchers and customers in Indonesia. But I got my start when I left school, um, jackarooing. So I went jackarooing down at Hay. And uh, fine wool, uh, and not, we, Tom wouldn't call them fine wool, but uh, we thought they were fine wool, but uh, basically sheep and cattle and cropping. I worked for Twynham for, for 10 years, um, started as a first year jackaroo and, uh, and worked my way up. And uh, yeah, we were cotton and grain and sheep and wool and, and beef and, and, and a pretty innovative company at, uh, with, with that. And I've given a lot of opportunities and I got a, an opportunity to, to study and, and, uh, and work uh, at the same time. Went to UNE, did rural science, and uh, you know played up and you know did the rock college thing and and uh, for a bit, but but worked you know most of the time. So for me, um, I you know I was lucky enough, I suppose that that I you know had a good work ethic, but plenty of people gave me a bit of a chance and. And I was fortunate enough to make the Australian meat judging team in 2000, which doesn't seem like that long ago, but when you do the maths, it's a bloody long time ago. Um, and uh, and was, went to the US and Japan and Korea uh, with ICMJ and, and really support ICMJ and, and always happy to give back to ICMJ and other, other things that, that have given me an opportunity um, to, to learn. And I, I learn a lot from that. So... Um, that uh, for me, that that's really really good. Spent a bit of time in North America um, and uh, and came back to Australia and I was yeah worked for Twinem again, running feedlots and and some farming operations and then ran a few feedlot businesses. Um, I then got into uh, a little bit more corporate ag and uh, ran a shipping company. We were you know, exporting and and got to learn about receivership of foreign entities and and running shipping companies around the world and things and did that for a while. Um, live export of cattle, I've always, uh, for the last sort of 15 years, been pretty heavily involved in, in live export, both as a trader and, and supplier. And we operate a couple of feedlots in Indonesia. I've been lucky enough to be involved in you know, air freighting a couple of thousand heifers to Russia and doing trade deals in China and, and, um, and uh, exporting cattle out of Uruguay to to uh, northern China and, and some really cool and exciting things, but yet it's all hard work. Um, you, you know, you end up making a fair few, you know, sacrifices, but through being grounded, having some shit under your boots some sort of, you know, meat under your fingernails mm -hmm. allows you to really talk the talk, the talk properly, be engaged with the, the team at the front line. And, uh, and do the deal, I suppose, and, and have those relationships and, and commitments. But, but actually knowing what happens in the industry, what happens on the ground is, is pretty important. Um, so I run CPC today, great, great bunch of people, great team. We're going through a management buyout um, and uh, you know, going through the process of getting mezzanine finance, all these really cool things that when I left school to Jackaroo, I would never thought that I would be had that opportunity to do. I also chair 
uh, Live Corp, the uh, service provider for the live export industry. Um, I chair a, a charity called Dolly's Dream um, and, uh, and do a few other industry things. I think it's important to give back to the industry. I got a lot out of ICMJ and other, you know, showing cattle and, and, uh, and people helping me. So I try to give a lot back. And through that, I learn a lot, but also get to meet great people. And that's where we meet most of our employees, most of our executive, most of our team. We, we advertise at CPC for, uh, for sort of entry level positions um, and, uh, and first years coming to get experience with us. But most of the people that we employ, we, uh, we meet through things like this and, and, uh, and don't never underestimate the value of, uh, of the extracurricular things you do at, uh, at college or in your work life and how that, uh, how that helps you grow and develop but also opens, uh, opens doors for you to, to choose whether you want to walk through or not. So I've rambled enough, Rosie, and uh, <laughs> I'll hand back, to, uh, hand back to you. No, that was great. Thank you. Um, some great advice on getting some shit under your boots and, and meat under your fingernails. Um, let's throw it over to Molly. Molly's uh, a bit earlier in her career than the other three panellists. Um, Molly's just, what, are you second year now in your graduate program? Yeah, second year now. Awesome. If you yep. give us a bit of an insight, that'd be great. Perfect. Um, well, thanks for listening, everyone. I'm spending your what is it, a Wednesday lunchtime. Um, yes, I definitely am not quite as advanced in my career as the other speakers here today. Um, but pretty much I went to Sydney Uni where I did an animal and veterinary bioscience degree uh, with honours in animal reproduction. And in 2018, I joined the Sydney Uni ICMJ team, so um, was pretty much here two years ago um, in Wagga. And from there I met the GM of Tees Wagga and uh, at one of the social um, networking nights and got offered a graduate program. So I'm a graduate in QA, QC and operations. Um, and so that pretty much involves moving around to the different departments, trying to learn the practices that they undergo um, in those uh, different areas. Uh, they throw in a few projects along the way. So certainly some things that uh, almost research studies and then some commissioning of some major capital projects, which has been pretty interesting uh, to be involved with. Uh, so yeah, definitely not quite as far along, but I'm happy to share what I can. <laughs> no, great stuff, Molly. Um, it just goes to show the common theme here is networking and, and the um, opportunities that come out of networking really is amazing. Um, just don't forget uh, questions. Please keep popping them in the chat there. Uh, let's hand over to our final panellist, Tom Bull. Um, Tom, if you could give us a bit of an insight into yourself and maybe a bit of an insight into Lampro as well. Uh, thanks, Rosie. Um... Yeah, we're Lampros based at Holbrook in southern New South Wales. Um, my background, I started off as a sheep mad kid who at the age of eight got five stud ewes and uh, every year since the age of eight, um, we've increased our ewe numbers on an annual basis. Uh, left school, went jackarooing on a mixed farming place at Harden. Um, Went to Orange Ag, which was actually, I went through that little window when I was Sydney Uni. Um, and I left university and I wanted to get in the land ministry, but it probably wasn't as sophisticated as what it is now. There was no cadetships. Um, yeah, so really I actually sent CVs to every major land company in the country um, when I left and there was no such thing as a graduate position. The only job I got was with an American company which had a philosophy that you can start, but everyone starts in the kill floor and you've got to work your way right through the boning room before you can go up the next level. So I did that um, for about nine months. However, the American company sold out and was moving back. Um, at that time in 98, MLA was commencing. So I got a job in the processing industry there. Um, I had a philosophy that I wanted to actually get off farm and learn more about end market. Um, in there, I actually managed a project called Viascan, which was a meat yield measurement technology. Um, I managed that from a prototype right through to commercialization, um, and then became the marketing manager for Viascan for Australia and New Zealand, which was a great opportunity because I got to do business plans for nearly every major processor um, in the two countries, which was a, which was a great um, learning curve. Um, 
2001, I decided to come home um, with the help of my father, bought my first property. And uh, since then, yeah, have kept expanding. Um, Lampro now is the largest supplier of lamb genetics to the Australian industry. Um, in 2020, we're expecting a million lambs born will be by our genetics. Um, we sell rams up the eastern seaboard. We export genetics. Um, and we're just dabbling into the world of high-end lamb production. Um, probably like the other speakers, it is, you know, we like practical people. You know, it's um, everyone does everything. Um, you know, we like people who understand the practicalities of the sheep industry. And, um, you know, certainly everyone here gets in and does the hard work as well as the strategic stuff as well. Um, yeah, great. It's a great concept, ICMJ. I think we've been speaking for about eight or nine years. Um, and certainly, yeah, with your involvement, ask questions and uh, network, it's a great initiative. And I um, always applaud the organisers doing this on an annual basis. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Um, just to reiterate, the chat box is on your right. So if you could please uh, put your questions in there. We've had one question come through. This one's for Molly. Um, since graduating, what's been the biggest learning curve um, being employed in the industry? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I would say that uni is very different to full-time work. So the biggest learning curve for me has been adjusting from, um, yeah, that uni setting, which in, in many regards it does prepare you for work and in many stances it doesn't. Um, so I would say that the biggest thing has been adapting to that. Uh, in terms of maybe my like what I thought was different from uni to work, um, I think I was surprised that they don't really expect you to have that much knowledge going in. If you don't know every single thing about meat, science and beef or pork or lamb or whatever you're going into, that's okay. Um, I think the biggest thing is more about that passion, that curiosity and the determination to actually go and learn that, um, that information once you're there. So... Yeah, I would say the biggest learning thing is just that adaptation. Um, <laughs> Perfect. From uni to work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Margot, you've had a pretty diverse uh, career. Um, for someone that doesn't have much experience, um, what's your opinion on gaining that work experience prior to employment? Yeah, so look, when I'm, I'm looking at people who are coming in to join us, it's a bit like what the other panel said looking at what you've done other than just just study, where you've got involved, whether it's ICMJ, whether it's Horizon Scholarships, um, whether you've had those jobs during breaks, all of those things add up to make you a really good employee. Um, but probably just to draw on what Molly's talking about, don't be afraid to ask questions. And if you meet people who you do find interesting, ask them questions, but stay in touch. You probably find most people um, are actually happy to stay in touch and be a bit of a sounding board as you go through the next steps. So you don't have to do it on your own. Use those networks and people around you and ask questions. And um, yeah, exactly what Molly said. We don't expect everyone to know everything there and then. But if you see something you like, there used to be a big push that you had to have in my life mapped out for the next five years. What that actually does is means you don't always look at the opportunities that are right in front of you or get put in because it doesn't fit a plan. Sometimes it's okay to not know where you're going um, and to just try things that are different, try different industries, push yourself outside the comfort zone. Um, for someone who's in pork and knew nothing about pork apart from a love of bacon, um, you can learn anything and ask the right questions. So that would be my advice. Awesome. I see you're already replying, Troy. <laughs> Do you want to give a bit of an insight into Ripley's uh, question? Thanks uh, for those that did come to the chat. Ripley asked me uh, the value of uh, people who can speak uh, advanced uh, Bahasa Indonesian and how employable does it make them for, for our business. Um, certainly does. It's uh, you know, one of the, the challenges that we have with you know, 600 people that speak Bahasa and 200 people that speak Indonesian and probably 20 that speak both languages well is, is that communication. So communications very important, but it's also type of communication. It's not just uh, the the language difference in terms of English versus, uh, versus uh, Bahasa. Some of our biggest challenges sometimes are our finance team talking to our operational team, the people who speak Northern Territorian 
can be really difficult to understand what they what they are uh, they're asking or, or wanting. And I say that a bit tongue in cheek, but it is uh, it's real in terms of, uh, of that. So. Yeah, Bahasa is a, a great skill to have. We're always looking for people that have got interest in uh, Indonesian language and culture, but also what other skills and what other in you know, inquisitivenesses do you bring to, to the table as well? Have you, you know, do you have an inquisitive nature? Do you want to learn more? And, and often people who've learnt another language, you know, I look at that and say, wow, they've got some inquisitive nature there. They've, they've got a sort of continual learning drive. They're, they're more than just the status quo. So, you know, Certainly interested in uh, in catching up with Ripley, but um, but also you know when you're applying for a job and and when you're talking to other people, you know don't oversell yourself, but don't be afraid to talk about those other skills that you have, those other interests that you have, because it shows drive and commitment and passion. And and you may have come, you may have been in the you know the 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 C or D grade netball team at university. You might have been the worst hockey player, but if you went to training every week and you you know caught up with the team and you had a crack and you had a go and it's something that you find really interesting, that's actually more interesting to me than that you got you know first place in biochem or and not taking anything away from you who came first in biochem. I had to do a special for it, um, but you know it's it's those interactions those skills of those those additional things that you've done that you can interact with people and, and the team and you know i look at people in our business who can be engaging with a customer and engaging with a greater driver on the same day are, are really important and the greater drivers in our business are just as important as the station managers they contribute significantly to our maintenance and they contribute significantly to our cost reductions and things and so those those broader skills are, are really valuable Absolutely. Teamwork is everything, isn't it? Yeah. Um, another question has come through. I might throw this open to the entire panel. Uh, what are the panellists' thoughts on for roles that aren't grad-based? So would you encourage people to apply anyway or would you prefer that they do get enough skills to be somewhat confident in, in the role? I'm, I'm happy to, to, to start. Um, I think if you look at any role... And, you know, if you look at it and go, I would like that role in the future, but I don't think I'm there yet. Don't be afraid to throw your hat in the ring. Like, because, um, you know, you've got to have practice at getting jobs. You've got to have practice at interviews. And, and so it might be two steps away from where you think you're going to be, but an uh, employer may want to back the talent. They might want to back the energy. They might say, sorry, you missed out today on that second or third year role, but I've got another role for you. So you never know. Have a crack, have a go. Um, but also look at, you know, the skills you've got and the experiences that you've got and really, you know, when you read the job ad or you're talking to someone is, is actually, you know, look at it and say, how do I, how do I fit in? Where are my gaps? Because you don't know who else is applying and, uh, and really just, you know, stretch and apply yourself as well. There's not a lot of graduate roles out there. I don't mean to sound down. There's not a lot of job ads that say graduate. There's very few. But there's lots of job ads that say, you know, analyst or they say, um, you know, production coordinator or say, you know, marketing assistant or, you know, you know, uh, you know similar types of things like that. And you might go, well, I've never been an analyst. I've never been a production coordinator. I've never been a quality control manager. But you may have, you know, organised the something. You might have organised the social club at, at college. You might have been in the treasurer of the bloody footy club. You, you could have, um, you know, gone and worked at, on farms during, or in abattoirs during your holidays and there's a lot of experience that you can tick a lot of those boxes. So I'd stretch myself and have a go at applying for jobs other than graduate jobs. Yeah, great stuff, Troy. Um, Rosie, so can I just yeah. add to that one? Um, one of the things that's really important, it doesn't matter whether you're coming out of university or you're applying for executive job, make a phone call to the person who's on the ad or on the list or someone in the company before you even put your application in. Just ask, say, I'm interested in the role. Here's my skills. This is what I, I'm thinking. Um, I think I fit type thing. And it's a really good approach because they may even come back to you and say, you're not quite right for that role. You're right for this role. So never don't make that phone call because you get too nervous or scared. You know, it's actually nice to get a letter across your desk or a resume or something and you've had a conversation you can link it to. So 
Um, yeah, and don't be afraid to take short-term roles. You don't have to sign up for a two-year contract or a next job. Sometimes a six-month entry into an organisation might lead to something pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. It's just having that courage to start the conversation and you never know where it might end up. Um, while we're just talking about interviews, uh, so for upcoming graduates, what is your singular best piece of advice heading into interview preparation? We haven't heard from you, Tom, in a bit. Have you got some advice going into interviews? Um, I probably wouldn't be as structured, but I think probably the biggest advice I can give you just can smell people who are really keen, you know, really want to ask questions. And that doesn't matter where it's an interview. You know, we get a lot of uh, university um, people coming, doing work experience, for example. Um, we can tell straight away how keen they are by how many questions they ask. So in the interview, whether on work experience, I think probably the best thing is showing interest, you know, to, to ask questions about, you know, the business, um, in everything you do because it just stands out. You know, I can go through everyone we've ever had and you know the people who really want to be here and that's based on the questions they ask, um, not about what they say about themselves. Yeah, that much of the learn. Uh, another question for Troy or Tom. Would you recommend Jillaroo or Jackaroo work as a career starting point for those completing ag slash animal degrees? It has so much appeal, but I'm unsure of how long to stay in a Jillaroo position and where to go from there career-wise. Look, I, I, I would um, recommend it, but it, it's certainly not for everyone. But it's, you know, I, I took a year off. I didn't take a year off. I worked, but I, I sort of, you know, stepped start sideways, I suppose, for, for a year and went and worked in the US and Canada and, and all around farms and did a bit of training and stuff when I, when I left university. And... Or finish my university and that that was really valuable for me it, you know it wasn't life reflection or any of that sort of softer stuff it was more out it's got so much experience I learned more about you know working with different people from different backgrounds working you know working up and down the chain and, and learning a lot of a lot of production information and stuff like that and and that was really valuable for me so I think going and doing the Jillaroo Jackaroo thing for a year or two after you finish university is is a great a great step you may hate it you may love it um, you'll get a huge amount of skills and experiences that are really practical that you can use and you might want to become a you know anything and and I think that that experience is really good and, and you know one or two years in your career in your 20s to get more practical understanding get more rounded as an individual will certainly help you in your career longer term no matter what you do even if you step out of agriculture. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Um, my only advice, so it doesn't matter whether it's jillarooing, whether you're working in a processing plant um, on, a, on a live ship, you know, it's all about learning. And I think while you're young, you've got to take that opportunity to keep learning because it's a lot harder when you do get married and have kids and whatnot, you're not as transportable. So you take the opportunity. Um, don't get too comfortable, you know, keep pushing yourself, keep keep trying to put yourself out of comfort zone and learn more and more about the industry. Um, I do see some people get too fixed in one part of the industry and have a pretty narrow mind. So yeah, the, the more cross section or cross sectional experience you can have um, from my opinion, the better. I think Rosie, just to add to, to what Tom said, I'd be, um, if you're going to go jillarooing or jackarooing or you're going to go and work in a meat processing plant on the floor, or you're going to go and do those things, Try and do it in a, an organisation. There doesn't necessarily have to be upward scope in that organisation for you to become a supervisor or a manager, but someone that's pretty broad in thinking. And I'm, I'm really trying not to knock family operations because there's some really cool family operations. Tom's family operations is a good example of you'll get stretched, you'll learn lots of different skills, you interact with good people. But, you know, don't just go jillarooing or jackarooing or working at, meat, at any meat processing facility. Pick one that there's, you know, diversity and training and, and opportunity for you to, to, to learn and, and, uh, and have a good time. Just don't go and work for the farmer down the road for a year um, just because it seems fun and he's a good mate at dad's or something like that. Get out of your comfort zone and get with someone who's going to stretch you and, and is going to appreciate you stretching them as well. 
Yeah, and challenge yourself and yep. and a place that has scope to grow. Yeah, yeah. great advice. Um, one, more, sorry. one more comment. Those first few years out of university, treat them like they are university. You know, treat them as a learning path. You know, and I think put yourself in whatever job is going to add the most to your education, you know, because you will learn a lot more those first three years out of university than you probably will in. So really find that organisation that's going to let you grow. Um, it's not a job, you know, treat it, you know, don't go for the money. Um, go for where you're going to get that best bang for your buck and learn off the best. Just quickly, can certainly attest to that. Um, every day learning something completely different um, and real practical skills, not necessarily um, everything that you've learnt in uni. So certainly every day of learning and 100% um, agree with what Tom said. That's a great segue. Um, Molly, we've just had a question come through. Um, what's the best way to get a start in the broader ag industry and gain experience when you don't really know specifically what direction you want to take and where you want to go within the industry? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I would say to start off with, join the ICM Day Careers Festival. <laughs> That's going to happen in a couple of days. Um, there's a lot of great companies there that you can, even if you're not set on anything in particular, just go and have a chat to them. You'll probably surprise yourself. I, um, I personally wanted to be a vet when I joined, um, like started my degree. I thought, that's it, that's my pathway, I'm gonna be a vet. And it was very quickly that I realized I didn't wanna do that and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and it wasn't until I joined ICMJ and uh, there was just something, um, I can't even tell you what it was, but there was something about teas that just I really liked. And so I went and investigated that further. So I would say um, look out for the companies that there's just something special about them that makes you want to learn more about them. Um, and from there, go and ask someone from the company to, if you can buy them a coffee and pick their brains about something. Um, I don't know too many people that will say no to a free coffee. So <laughs> just ask them and email and like Margot was talking about, you know, keep in touch with people. It's the best way to work it out. Um, even with my grad program now, I still don't know exactly where I want to end up. I just know that I really like the industry and I really like the company and happy to play it day by day at this point, you know, so. Yeah, it's keeping that communication open, isn't it? Absolutely. A uh, question for you, Margot. How would you suggest a young graduate approach keeping in contact with larger companies slash employers such as yourself in order to maintain that key networking connection to the industry? Yeah, probably probably the best first point is we're not scary. Um, most, most of the CEOs are, are pretty approachable. Um, most of the people in companies are pretty approachable and um, generally we're all really happy to give back. Um, mine's very much more personal. There's a probably uh, a handful of people, if not more, that I personally mentor, um, which is a bit more engaged, probably, you know, a phone call every couple of months. But in terms of that, it's actually being brave enough to just ask people if you can stay in touch with them, use them as a sounding board. Um, there's an element of, you know, there are people who are quite busy, so just finding a way and actually asking how did they stay in touch, you know, is it a text message saying, hey, can we have a chat? I, I just need some thoughts or advice. Um, but yeah, it's just old school, old fashioned <laughs> contact, send them an email, ask them if you could stay in contact, get the mobile number, um, just things like that. And then just be conscious of, you know, their times versus your times and when they're available. But um, yeah, most people are actually happy to be a sounding board and give advice, but just be clear on what you want from them. If you want a mentoring relationship, that's slightly more structured and, you know, it's more regular and a cup of coffee is not insane regularly. But yeah, um, any of us are happy to spend time on the phone and give advice. So, yeah, that would be my thoughts on that. Margot, I know you're very passionate about um, mentor programs. Uh, is there some sort of advice you could give in finding that mentor or, yeah? Yeah, and um, so my best advice is you're going to have a few mentors throughout your career and throughout your life and you're going to be looking for different ones. You might have people who you just specifically talk to about work and career opportunities. And then you need to have a couple of mentors who you know you can talk to about who you are um, and let them get to know you a bit more personal. Because you want to be able to call them and say, I found this job, I found this role, do you think it's right for me? 
So you want to have that little bit of those couple of trusted people that might be completely outside the industry, um, just someone you've connected with. Um, so I've still got an old boss of mine from 20 years ago who I have lunch with probably once a year, have a phone call or an email a couple of times during the year. So the contact doesn't have to be all the time. And then of course I've got people who specifically just about careers. So you probably want about four or five mentors. And then my last advice, I know it's really strange, but you often see people that you quite admire their qualities or admire who they are, but you might not meet them. That's okay to just watch them from afar, not in a weird stalker through the window approach, <laughs> but you might just want to, if they're presenting at something or if they're um, doing media or they've written an article, just little insights like that. So mentoring can take many different forms, but I highly recommend it. Um, and I just think it's a little bit of work for you as well to make sure you're staying in touch, but um, yeah, really valuable. Yeah, definitely. Um, Troy, we've got a question for you. Uh, someone who is wondering how to gain contacts overseas in the US and Canada. Uh, they want to go overseas to see how other countries run their agriculture industries, but don't know where to find the contacts. What's your advice? Ed, thanks. And thanks, uh, Rachel, for the, the question. Um, look, part of it is just get a plan, buy a ticket um, <laughs> and go, I suppose. I was fortunate enough that I was uh, already heading to the US with a uh, intercollegiate meat judging. So I was, I was there. I didn't really have a big plan and in 12 months I went to 36 states um, and just about every state in Canada through, you know, word of mouth, get to know people when you're there. You know, people like to, if you're genuinely interested in them, they become interested in you and people, you know, I just was lucky that people would say, oh, you know, I've got a friend that's got some bulls that are really good and I want to go and see them and keep an eye on short courses and you just get to know people and suddenly people are helping you get around and, you know, go, oh, you know, I've got a friend over there who's got a good property or I've got a friend that's in the meat processing industry and that's how I got around. Um, in terms of actually getting that start, I think, is just reaching out, is, is have a bit of a straw man of a plan and say, right, I'm going to go ahead to the US and Canada next year and I'm going to leave in January. Who do I know? I know Molly works for Tees Cargill. Cargill got a couple of abattoirs in the US. I'll, I'll send Molly an email and say, hey, Molly, can you give us a hand? I just need you know, someone in the Cargill team. You know, that, could, I, could I get a start? Because I'm really interested in feedlotting and this is, you know, not trying to put Molly on the spot too much. But <laughs> that's, that's sort of how it is. And, and just you know, don't try and be too structured, but just have a few key contacts, have a few plan Bs and, and be pretty bloody flexible and you'll get around the country pretty well. We all know people overseas and, and it's that it's just, yeah, yeah, you'll feel it'll, it'll happen pretty easily for you. I think if you just put a straw man together and get on with it. Yeah, absolutely. And the alumni out of just the ICMJ program is yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. And, you know, university connections or, or college connections don't, don't underestimate that how they flow you, you know, You'll get yeah, through ICMJ. You know, I judged meat in the US with West Texas A&M uh, for a couple of conferences over there because I'd run into someone from West Texas A&M who knew someone who'd been to UNE, and you know, bang, suddenly we were mates, and you know, sleeping on someone's floor, and you, you know, you're you're away. So, yeah, awesome stuff. Um, so we've had one. How should graduates from an international background present themselves to recruiters? Would recruiters prefer graduates from a domestic background? since international graduates would have a higher risk in leaving the company and heading back overseas. Um, Margot, do you want to touch on that one? Thanks, Ros. Um, look, I think if you're, um, if I put it black and white, if you're an international um, student, um, when you're applying for jobs, um, make that phone call, make it clear that you've got those basic skills, whether it's language, whether it's an understanding, whether it's visa, issues and things like that. So make sure you don't rule yourself out before you even get an opportunity to be considered. So that would be my first and foremost. And um, if there's anything you know the employer is specifically looking for, just make sure you put those skills up front um, so they know you have them. The pork industry is quite different. We actually have a very high international workforce because we need the skills. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of jobs here in Australia that um, Australians don't want to do. So International doesn't rule you out, um, but just make sure that you make that phone call and you've got those few basics that people might generally rule you out for straight away. 
Yeah, nice. Uh, we've had another question come through. What is your biggest bugbear when it comes to communication with potential or current employees? Tom, do you want to touch on this one? Sorry, hang on. Um... Biggest bugbear when it comes to communication with potential or current employees? Yeah, well, I mean, most of, you know, most of our people who are employed have come to us. Um, so, yeah, I find, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do, um, you know, people are actually being proactive. So, you know, we get a lot of CVs and out of that, you know, we certainly have employed people. In terms of bugbears, I mean, I've got no problem. I, I love getting a CV. Um, you know, I love people who are up front. Um, and also, yeah, I, I probably uh, I probably really appreciate that. So I don't have too many problems, too many bugbears, I suppose. Well, that's good. <laughs> Troy, do you want to comment on that one? Um, yeah, look, I, yeah, it's like Tom, love getting a CV. Love it when people... You know, if some I look at it as an employer, if someone takes the time to send you a letter, email their CV or come and visit your office, they're actually someone that you probably want to think about employing because they've thought long and hard about coming to you. So they, they've looked at you, looked at your web page, looked at your brand and your values or, or um, and so therefore you go, wow, they, these people, this person's actually come to me. So that's, that's pretty exciting. The things that I don't like is when you get your mum to send your CV through or your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Sounds small, but then I look at it and go, okay, so if you have to get someone else to send your CV, how are you going to deal with you know, conflict in the workplace? How are you going to send you know, customer requests? How are you going to deal with things? So do, you know, send it off your own email, pick up the phone yourself, um, and, uh, and that doesn't sound like much, but it's a, it's a real turn off when you get an email, when you get a CV from someone's mum. Um, I'm sure she's great. I'm sure she's excellent, but I've never employed anyone that their mother has sent their CV through. Great advice, Troy. Um, another question. Rose, can I just say something on that one? Um, don't apply for a job if you don't know what the company is. So if you're doing that blanket application to multiple companies and someone calls you and you don't actually know what the company is, that's really bad. So, and that can stay with you and they'll just cross your name off. So do a bit of homework on the company that you're trying to apply for if you do that blanket approach, that's, which don't recommend. Yeah, certainly. A little bit of time in research into finding out who the company is can pay dividends, can't it? So last, uh, we just had another question come through. Are uh, you all finding a lack of production-based knowledge amongst employees being a problem? We'll, we'll throw that open to anyone who wants to jump in there. Um. I'd probably only comment I'd make. I don't see a production, a lack of knowledge. It's more of a thirst to learn. You know, if someone's got a thirst to learn, you know, you can fill in the gaps. Um, yeah, so not a big problem from our end. Yeah, look, Rosie, we, you know, for our entry level jobs each year, we need 30 or 40 people. We get, we would trim that down to three or 400 CVs to go through properly. Um, and, uh, and and really think about. And at least half the people we employ have probably had no agricultural experience. So they're, they're not born on a farm, they, they don't live on a farm, um, but they've got a great work ethic, they might have played sport, they've got a hunger to learn, they, they, they can show some energy in their CV, they've done a few other things. So when I talk about experience, I think experience as you get older in your career is really, really important. The, you know, shit under your boots, meat under your fingernails is really important as you move, you know, I hate to put a number on it, sort of from your 30s onwards, but it, it's not always, you know, intelligence is, but in those junior, just out of college, you know, in your 20s, um, it's not about experience, it's about energy and drive and, and uh, inquisitiveness uh, for, for me. And again, we, most of the, about half who we, the people we employ don't have any farming history because we see them as just being sponges that are worth, inve worth investing in. The speed that a smart, inquisitive, energetic person can get up the curve and be more valuable than a, than a person who hasn't thought much about their career and got a whole lot of experience is, is pretty amazing. Yeah, just touching on that as well. Um, I would say that I don't come from a strong experience in the agricultural industry before I got 
my job. Um, my family does have a property out in Braidwood, uh, New South Wales, but we've only owned it maybe four years or so. Uh, and prior to that, grew up in Sydney. Um, you know, no real experience there in the meat industry or working at an abattoir or anything like that. And I think the reason people are hiring graduates uh, is because they have learnt those skills at university and they have that base level of knowledge and they're looking for people that are motivated to learn. You don't need to know every single thing about the industry that you want to work in. You just need to be curious enough to go out and actually learn it once you're there. Yeah, great stuff. Um, next question. What's the best piece of advice you would give to your 23 year old self? Margot, you want to give us some insight on being a 23 year old Margot? Thanks. Thanks, Roz. And I think I can remember back then. Um, Look, probably, probably I would actually just say have confidence to try something new would be the best advice I give myself. Don't box yourself in through your own head, known brain of what you can't do. Um, think about what you can do, what you can try, what you can learn, and just push yourself out of a comfort zone. If there's an ideal job somewhere but you're worried about moving there, just, just give it a go. Have confidence and back your own internal um, self to, to make the go of things. That would be my advice. And Tom, 23-year-old self? Yeah, I'm probably a little bit the same as Margot. I was just having that confidence and probably probably having a little bit more diverse approach, um, looking for wider opportunities and than just, um, you know, the immediate ones that fall in front of you and that whether that's international, um, you know, whether that's different industries as well, you know, why not go to the pork industry and learn something if you... If your career is in beef, or you think your career is in beef, don't be afraid to move an in industry because there's a lot really good systems in, say, beef and pork, and um, that uh, uh, someone who wants to another lamb industry would actually benefit from. So, yeah, open, take off the blinkers, and um, yeah, look at all the opportunities. Yeah, definitely. Oh, did you want to jump in there at all? Look, I, yeah, I probably don't have too much advice myself at Twitter because I look back and think of some of the things I was doing and the responsibility I had at 23 because Twynham, you know, who I worked for at the time, backed me. I, geez, I, yeah. I look back and think, God, I wouldn't employ myself to do that job today So because um, <laughs> I didn't have any experience. Um, I, yeah, look, I, I, I don't really have much more to add other than, you know, just, you know, keep going, you know, keep having a crack and keep learning and, and, uh, and get, uh, get more, more experience. So I think probably... Um, you know, one thing would be to delegate a bit more, I suppose, at that age for me, that at, at that age you're, you're wanting to learn and, and take everything in and, and absorb as much, which is, which is excellent, and, and work 20 hours a day and, and do all that sort of stuff. But, I, you know, in hindsight, I probably could have learned more if I delegated a bit more, I suppose, and, it, and I think that's, uh, that's always important in your, uh, in your career to, you know, to, to delegate and use people around you even more than what you do. Yeah, so that's in your role. You wish you had delegated a bit more out to people around you. Oh, I just look at you know, sit back. And, you know, I was trying to think back what I was doing when I was twenty three, and I, you know, I was running a feed lot and yeah, you know, and a farm and a station and stuff. And and uh, I look back and I, you know, I used to not delegate a lot, so I could have probably you know brought some more people along with me a bit better if I delegated back then. Yeah, nice, Molly. Are you twenty three yet? <laughs> um, I am currently 23, so I don't know if I've got too much advice for myself, but um, uh, I think the biggest thing um, which I often need to keep in mind uh, is not to rush. Um, I think very too, all too often people want to be entry level one day CEO, you know, a couple of days later, um, and it, it doesn't work like that, and it, it doesn't need to work like that. You just need to take the time go up a, you know, a couple steps each time and learn all you can in that role to prepare you for your next role. Um, you don't need to go from zero to 100 <laughs> in a matter of days. So I would say that. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much um, to our four panellists today. It's really been some, uh, some great engaging conversations. Um, we might wrap it up there. Um, thank you to all the students who jumped on on board today to be a part of the first careers panel um, online session.